Hello, good evening and welcome. As you've just heard, I work in the English department. So it might seem slightly confusing that I am putting on a lab coat. I assure you this is in fact a Halloween costume. I'm not a scientist. Stains are not actual blood, I promise. <laughs> the reason I'm putting it on is because I work with the intersections between science and literature. So for my PhD project, I'm looking at how bioengineering is written up. I'm looking at how authors write about the bioengineered body. The reasons I do that are partly personal fascination, um, but also because the way we write about science is not just a simple flow from science into fiction. It also works the other way around. So what's flashing up behind me soon are just a few of the very many headlines that appear in the media that talk about scientific discoveries using fiction as a kind of a shorthand. We hear about Frankenstein's, we hear about brave new babies. Part of the reason I do the work that I do is to be able to unpick the connotations that we load onto science when we talk about new discoveries using fiction as our rhetoric. So what I'm going to do tonight is whip you through a quick demonstration of how authors write about bodies that have been bioengineered or tweaked in some way. And in order to do that, I need my lovely research subjects. <laughs> so we have uh, three animal subjects and one human subject here. Now, of course, the classic text that talks about bioengineering is Frankenstein. What happens in the novel is probably quite familiar, but we have Dr. Frankenstein, who's interested in seeing whether he can reanimate a dead body. But he's not using one dead body. He uses parts. <laughs> the way he um, phrases this is that he collects from the charnel houses. So this is repositories of bones. He's collecting flesh, he's collecting skin, and he's assembling bits and pieces. Then he's putting them back together again. But they don't necessarily quite fit in the way they did before because they're all taken from different individuals. So everything is just slightly askew, and the resulting creature is never accepted as fully human. It's always considered monstrous in some way. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> a similar thing happens again in the island of Dr. Moreau. Dr. Moreau is another scientist experimenting with ways of reconfiguring the body, but this time he's not working exclusively with the human form. Sometimes he starts with human bits and pieces, but again he's deconstructing and taking from different animals as well to create a kind of hybridised form. <laughs> the resulting form is referred to as monsters manufactured. So again we have this notion of monstrosity coming through, of assembly, of bits and pieces morphed into something that they didn't start at. Huxley does something a little bit different in Brave New World. He again is working with a human form, but this time he's working with human characters that aren't born to parents in the way that we might expect. In fact, they are grown. So here they are, sitting in a lab, and depending on the class that the human is going to belong to, the economic function they will hold, they might be developed from one embryo, or they might be an embryo split into up to 10,000 different pieces. So if you are one ten thousandth of an embryo, you'll grow into an individual who might do low skill jobs. If you've developed from a whole embryo, you might do high skill jobs. But at any rate, you've developed in a lab-like setting. The way they refer to the process in the novel is to call it the principle of mass production at last applied to biology. So there's a real Model T for kind of production line connotation going on. The human body is being mass produced for an economic purpose. You might have noticed that these are all classic texts. They're all written quite a long time before our modern bioengineering field really came about. But they are all based on real science. Mary Shelley, when she wrote Frankenstein, was well versed with the experiments of Luigi Galvani, uh, who had managed to reanimate frog's legs using a static electric charge. When H.G. Wells wrote The Island of Dr. Moreau, he was working from a context of huge controversy around vivisection, around experimenting on live animals. 
And when Aldous Huxley wrote Brave New World, uh, there was a German embryologist called Hans Spiemann who'd managed to manipulate embryo cells inside the womb. So there was real bioengineering going into this work, but it was a kind of rudimentary early form. It was cut it open, poke around and see what happens kind of bioengineering. A very long way from what exists in the field today. These days, bioengineering tends to be a little bit more applied. It's a little bit more about problem solving. Um, for instance, there is one uh, team that has managed to grow a burger in a lab using stem cells taken from cattle and manipulating them into a ground beef product. There's a team in Korea that have managed to produce bacteria that excrete a gasoline substitute. Imagine powering your car with the uh, byproducts of bacteria. There's a team in the United Kingdom who have built a robot that is powered exclusively by brain cells that can actually learn how to avoid bashing into walls. And it is now possible to build a trachea that is modeled first in glass and then has the stem cells of a patient applied to it so that it can grow into a transplantable uh, trachea. So this is all very cutting edge work. Does the contemporary fiction of bioengineering draw from this kind of work? Let's take a look. Uh, Margaret Atwood's Oryx and Crake features a scientist named Crake who wants to optimize the human form. So he's not happy with this, he thinks we can do better. The way he wants to modify humans is to take adaptations from the animal kingdom and apply them so that we're better suited. So he starts with human genetic code and he adds bits and pieces. He adds genes from jellyfish, he adds genes from rabbits. He basically switches it all around so that there's a version of human, humanity that he thinks is well suited for its environment. This might resemble the island of Dr. Moreau style pastiche that we saw just earlier. It's a similar kind of building mechanism going on. But there is one slight difference. Craig is not working as a lone scientist. Moreau was stuck on an island and he was deemed a bit mad. But Craig has a little bit of backing. He's based in a corporate compound and he's got corporate money at hand. He's got funding. The reason he's got backers is because they want to be able to sell designer babies and the work that he's doing could lead on to that. This kind of economic imperative, a kind of commodification, comes through in even more of the contemporary fiction of bioengineering. So in Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell, we have, again, a human-looking form, but it's designed, it's engineered for an economic purpose. Son Me 451 is the name of the character in the story, and her colleagues and she are created, whoops, are created in a genomics unit. So they're, um, again, like Brave New World, developed essentially in bats. Uh, they're suspended in uterine gel while they grow. And they are designed to be great servers at a restaurant that is really similar to McDonald's in the descriptions. <laughs> um, so they are engineered so that they don't need very much sleep, um, so that they can work long hours. They're engineered to be always smiling so that their customers get great customer service. So again, we've got a commodification. These beings have been created so that they can serve the purpose in the economy. Kazuo Ishiguro's Never Let Me Go is a little bit different. So again, he's working with the human form. But in the novel, humans that are considered undesirable, um, drug addicts, criminals, and so forth, are cloned. So you start with your original, and you clone. The novel opens on the clone's children at school. They don't know that they're clones at all, they just think they're ordinary children. But we see them slowly realising that they have been cloned and that their purpose in life is economic. They are going to be ripped apart and their parts, their organs, are going to be sold for transplant. They are going to keep donating their organs until they complete or die. This economic use of the body is coming through really loud and clear. And in fact, that's one of the key findings of this research. So what's happening to the body in the fiction of bioengineering? Well, it's all in parts. It's all stripped asunder. It's assembled. It's deconstructed. It's never considered a cohesive whole unit. It's always disassembled. It's also very strongly exploited. 
So whether it's a corporation in control or a mad scientist, there is someone trying to get use out of the bioengineered body. It's heavily animalised, so it's referred to often as a slab of meat or um, beastly in some way. And crucially, it's kept separate from the unmodified human body. There's a real biological class system building in this fiction. One of the key findings of the research is that the contemporary fiction of bioengineering doesn't actually have much relation to what's going on in the field right now. So the texts that we've looked at that are a little bit later relate more to the earlier texts than they do to actual scientific discovery. We saw in um, Oryx and Creek a strong relation to the island of Dr. Moreau. In Cloud Atlas, there's a strong relation to the growing in jars idea from Brave New World. So if the contemporary fiction of bioengineering is not responding to science necessarily, and the early fiction of bioengineering was written a long time before we even had a field, does that make it responsible then to use these kinds of headlines when we talk about science? I'd like to suggest that this sort of rhetoric is really misleading. When we use terms like Frankenscience, we're bringing in a whole lot of negative connotations that often have very little to do with the actual scientific discovery that we're talking about. This is a form of discourse that is encouraging suspicion. It's actively scaremongering. And I hope that my research can help to strip away some of those connotations so that we can have a more open dialogue when we talk about science. Thank you very much for your attention, and we should have time for, I think, one or two questions if you want to answer.